but um, I, I don't. I, I'm just. I'm, I'm on this kick at the moment. I'm watching like a lot of Joan Crawford and Betty Davis's films. I don't know. Oh yeah. <laughs> I have no idea why it just sort of spontaneously happened. And on the back of that, I you know watching uh, whatever happened to Baby Jane, which is like one of the best films ever made. It's just, but it's so horrible. It's oh god. So, <laughs> It's so disturbing, honestly. It, it there's something about Betty Davis's performance. She she portrays like mental illness so sincerely. Mm-hmm. There's there's something about it where you think, is this real? Is it because you, you when you do you know anything about like the background of of that, like the feud between her and uh, Joan Crawford, who's a co-star in it? No, I don't know. Oh my god, honestly, they they hated one another. And oh, it's no. like <laughs> it's 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 one of my little obsessions. I love reading about the feud between Joan Crawford and Betty Davis because they were vile to one another. It the must be the they, stuff of legend. Oh, it is, honestly, it's it is Hollywood legend. The things <laughs> they did to one another to undercut one another to to undermine one another's successes and victories and spread rumors and it, it's unbelievable. The viciousness of it was, was just unbelievable. And they brought that to this dynamic in, in on screen. So it feels really, really sincere. The hatred and the bitterness. And at that point, both of them were going through some stuff. You know, they'd had various addictions. They'd had, like, divorces. And Joan Crawford was losing all of her money. And... And Betty Davis had did actually have mental health problems at that point. So there's something awfully real about watching that film. Yeah. I don't have to watch it again now. <laughs> off. I just, I can't get over it. her performance. This, I mean, Joan is great too. Joan Crawford is amazing in it, but Betty Davis as Blanche. Oh my God. It, it's, it's so complete. He's the kind of character where, She's a bit like um, certain portrayals of the Joker. Mm -hmm. You sincerely don't know how that character's going to react to stuff or what she's going to do. (laughs) And it makes her really scary. Yeah. uh, You know, for such such an old film, um, for a film that has a lot of the cliches of its era, Mm -hmm. it, it gets under your skin. It makes you feel, you know, it's, it, oh, I won't watch it again for a while. <laughs> it scarred you for, for a little minute. <laughs> yeah, but I, there is, um, I don't know whether you ever saw it, but there's a great dramatization of that exact feud. Called, it's called Feud. It's, it's, it's a, a series that's on Amazon. And they've got Susan Sarandon playing Betty Davis. And it's Jessica Lang playing Joan Crawford. And they are perfect oh i love jessica lang me too i've got such a th- I, honestly any anything with jessica lang even like you know how you know american horror story where some of the seasons are great and some of them are not so great yeah it's jessica lang in it oh, yeah. yeah love it yeah you know that's that's going to be one of the good seasons if you got jessica lang <laughs> totally and, and anything with her in it and I, I mean susan sarandon's an absolute powerhouse as well so getting those two together yeah, I, I, they they are so brilliant in that series. They must have done so much research looking at how that those women spoke and 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 moved, and mm-hmm. they feel so real. You're watching it; it's like it's 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 a bit like a documentary almost. It's got that feeling about it, rather than a drama. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, but, wow, I, I've, I've seen it so many times, but I'm going to watch it again. You know, just because. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to. Ha- I'm going to have to now. <laughs> oh, honestly, I I can't recommend it. I mean, funnily enough, it's 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 a Ryan Murphy series, like, like American Horror Story. Oh, is uh, it? <laughs> but it's. I think it's for my money. I think it's probably one of the best things he's ever done. Oh, I'm very intrigued. It, <laughs> really, it's so it captures both the reality and the myth beautifully. Mm-hmm. I mean, from what I understand from my own reading, because I've read so many books about that, about that whole thing, the series, if anything, underplays how desperately vile they were. <laughs> desperately vile is such a good um, description. <laughs> but I, I, I can't, 
I find it difficult reading like about the situation. I, I find it difficult comprehending how awful they were to one another. Yeah. It, like if they just stopped. Because yeah. they were doing there came a point where they moved apart. They were operating in different circles. They were not in one another's lives anymore. And it had all died down. But they couldn't keep themselves <laughs> from interfering and just bringing it back up turning the screw a little bit more you know um it would have just died away it would have just gone away and that would have been the end of it but no they couldn't let it's like it was a hatred for the ages that was yeah that's 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 true hatred isn't it right as 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 bizarrely attractive and indelible as love yeah you know, it, they were definitely like they were definitely the most important people in one another's lives you know yeah. <laughs> kids their husbands all of that kind of went by the wayside <laughs> in comparison to this they were the most enduring relationship to one another yeah that's that's um hilarious <laughs> Isn't it? Isn't it? I, I, I cannot leave it alone. I can't get over it. But anyway, yes. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, Kaylee, by the way. Oh, it's um, my pleasure. Thank you for having oh, me again. Oh, always. Anytime. Anytime. And also, I, I went out and actually, I know you sent me a PDF of your short story collection, The End, but I went, I went and bought the book. because. Oh, you know. thank you. <laughs> no, not a problem. Not a problem. I mean, for one thing, I love these books. The, the Black Shuck Shadows series. Yeah, uh, I collect them. On me too. They look so beautiful on a bookcase, don't they? Yeah, all lined up next to each other if you're collecting yeah. them as well. <laughs> yes, in order, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, of they course. They <laughs> are so stylish. That's yeah. what I love about them. I love the way covers like symbolically reflect what's going on inside. I, I just I love that. And the theming of them. Yeah. Love, I've just got a thing about short story collections that have a running theme where it's not just you know collection x or collection a i love that i love that so much and yours the well the, the title says it all and the, the the picture of the mushroom cloud on the on the front of course yeah uh, I, I was yeah. so pleased when uh, steve sent that to me i was like that's exactly yeah. <laughs> honestly the, steve does good work doesn't he yeah yeah he's a he does good work it's yeah. beautiful i mean and i i tell you what i love the theme of this one because i think I think uh, you know, not just after COVID, but generally, it's it's on everyone's mind, isn't it? Yes. Well, the end. Yes. <laughs> it's one know? of my um, favorite topics in horror. Yeah, and I, I think we are seeing. There's a lot of apocalyptic horror at the moment, isn't there? There's yeah. a lot of it out there, and I, I think that's that. That's why I think what you're getting is sort of like a reflection of systemic breakdown, ultimately, because yeah. that. That's what horror does, doesn't it? At its best, it kind of it reacts to and reflects what's going on in culture, but it's the subconscious stuff that nobody wants to talk about effectively. Yeah. It's the nightmare stuff. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the minute I got this, I was in. I was in, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad to, glad to hear it, and I, I hope it didn't um, disappoint. <laughs> Not at all. No, there's a couple in particular I really loved. I loved the, the opening one, The Claim They Stake. I thought th the minute I read that, I was like, I love the way you like that you took a very particular kind of apocalyptic scenario. It's almost like the suggested apocalypse, you know, where it's it's almost the, it's it's the David Icke Nibiru reptilian conspiracy theory stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Treated it completely seriously, like down the line, completely seriously. I thought that was a really clever way of of of, of examining that, you know. I you <laughs> no, my pleasure my pleasure and i loved the paranoia of it i love the paranoia of it where because you know because you are seeing things from the perspective of billy and you know through suggestions that he's had issues in the past you you, yeah. you don't know if he's reliable or not yeah i i really um I, I redrafted that one loads of times because i couldn't mm. quite decide where i wanted to go with it in the end but um I was happy with where I landed. <laughs> yeah, I liked it too. I really liked it. And I I like the way you kind of like straddle the ambiguity throughout up until really up until the end, you know. I thought that was really really cool because it's a difficult thing to write about that kind yeah. of that kind of conspiracy theory because it can so easily 
lead the reader in the wrong direction, you know? I mean, I was reading it and thinking it'd be be very difficult, but really, really fun to expand on this. Like, to, because I think, like, the idea could expand into a wider mythology. You know, it could be like a like novel length easily. Yeah, I had I had many um many drafts of it because I had I had some longer drafts, some some shorter, and mm. then I started thinking, oh I, I think I could expand, but then I wanted to it was really like the overall theme that I wanted to expand on. I was like, well I can do that with the rest of the book. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of mm. course. But I liked the fact that in this one, the apocalypse is kind of, it's already happened, hasn't it? Like, the, the, these creatures are already embedded, and yeah. <laughs> that's it. It's over already. There's nothing really Billy can do. He's just kind of unfortunate. Yeah, that's um, my favourite kind. I, I think that that's one of my favourite kinds of sort of, like, horror main characters is when things are just a bit like out of control and yeah, I like that. yeah um and in it's comedy i enjoy sorry go on oh no 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 no. go on i was gonna say in comedy which that th- which this particular story wasn't but um hmm. uh i really enjoy unfortunate characters where things just happen to them yeah but it, there's nothing they can do there's and that that is like a, a running theme in this story in fact the collection has that really you know mm-hmm. almost every story has that where characters are they're operating in mythologies or circumstances where sometimes they think they know what's going on mm-hmm. and so they, they assume completely what's going on and then it's revealed that not at all in fact my my other like the one i really really responded to with omega oh thank you that's I my love, uh, favorite uh, one <laughs> i loved that one i think the reason i loved that one so much is because it it chimed with like an idea I've had, I've had floating around my own head for the longest time, which is, of course, it's it's the notion that you could. Uh, this, it's exactly what you do. It's exactly what you manifest in the story, which is you could have like a a rapture event as as it's as it's detailed, as it's proclaimed by your sort of evangelical fundamentalist Christians or whatever whatever branch of fundamentalist or literalist you want to talk about. You could have it down to the wire where there are angels and where there are, there's an ascension and where everything happens as they proclaim it's going to happen. But it doesn't necessarily mean even then that they're right. Mm hmm. Yeah. I, I, I had a few, I think a few things probably inspired that one. Um, that story initially was headed in a completely, well, similar sort of um, type of scenario as what you get but it was um it was going to be a bunch of people on a beach all catching fire right (laughs) but (laughs) then i saw saint maud and i was like oh "Oh, shit yeah they've done it (laughs) yeah so i um i started thinking of what might be worse if you're someone that's in that group um and i'm afraid of heights (laughs) oh Oh, so <laughs> yeah, delving deep into like your own personal phobia here, then yeah. Yes, and I'm also I'm um I'm a huge Midnight Mass fan. I think we talked ah. about that last time, and um the sort of the interpretation of the the Bible in that I was like that is so um clever. So I can't remember what the timeline of me. I must have watched Midnight Mass before. I wrote that story because Uh I'm thinking about when it came out. But um, yeah, I think that that might have been somewhere in the back of my head as well. It is. I mean, I I just love the fact that like the main character, she, she like, she, I love the way you can not only see her realization, but her losing her face, you know, basically as this is happening around her. (laughs) So so, yeah, there's there's a lot of damage there. I mean, it's bleakly funny. In its own peculiar way. And there is, you know, for those of us who don't really like that kind of ideology and have real problems with it, there is a kind of grim satisfaction as well. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I I'll uh, totally take that. I probably looked quite evil as I was sort of like smirking away to myself yeah. writing that. Um, cause I knew, I knew where that, that I knew that that was going where it was going. And, um, yeah. 
I'm also somebody who I don't have an issue with um, anyone that has a faith particularly, but I do have an issue with um, the actual Bible, um, which that might make me unpopular to some people, but, um, and I've read it. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't think it's a great book to base your moral principles from if you've read it in its entirety. (laughs) Not at all. No, when you've got like, you know, bits like you know that bit of exodus they always cut out that whenever they do an adaptation they always go up to the point where after um the uh, the israelites have escaped pharaoh and the, the the ocean is closed over the the egyptian armies it ends there it ends there they never carry on because if they did you'd see god ordering the israelites to slaughter the midianites like to take their land and murder them and it, 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 it it's not it's not nice it's not good you no, know it's qu- quite quite a lot of instructed murder yeah in, in, yeah for a book that where most people just remember thou thou shalt not kill yeah which is fair <laughs> enough in and of itself but <laughs> yeah yeah there, um, it, and i can see why they don't carry on that story ever Although it would be yeah. interesting to see the sequels, wouldn't it? You know, if someone had the guts to do it. Yeah, we'll make it like an eight-part series. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my God, it would be it would be unpleasant. I um I do mine um the Bible a little bit for sort of like ideas because mm. it, I I do think it's it's I I'm not a religious person at all, so to me that is just a book, um, yeah. and it's full of quite like scary ideas to me. So absolutely, I mean, like, I mean, Revelations is brilliant. I mean, oh, that's, that's my favorite. <laughs> me too. It's, it's. I'm telling you, whoever wrote that, I'm sure they were on something. Do you know? Maybe it, they. <laughs> you yeah, know, maybe they found some mushroom or something, you know, up in the mountains or whatever. But they were tripping when they wrote that. I was talking about that to my husband just yesterday and I said that, um, you know that South Park episode where they open the gate to Imagination Land and then they bring in Michael Bay and um, he's like, and then we can have that and the poah! And then the the meteor can come to poah! Um, (laughs) That's that's what just Revelations reminds me of. Like that kind of energy. Yes, yeah, honestly, it is bonkers revelations but it it is by far my favorite of the books of the bible by far because it's so it's so lacking in literalness you know most of the other books there's like this happens and then this happens and then this happens revelations is just mad it's imagery it is mad bonkers crazy imagery all the way through and it makes (laughs) not a lick of sense which i love the beasts with all the heads with the uneven number of eyes and the trumpets and the you know there's a lot Babylon going- and all of that it's, it's the monsters are great that's another yeah. thing i like about it it's got great monsters in it you know if i'm ever stuck for a monster if you go and read revelations you'll find one somewhere <laughs> and it'll be so freaky weird yeah it's um <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's a good read i will say <laughs> it is it is i mean i i loved dead as well i mean dead made me laugh dead oh, uh, it you. really really made me laugh it's got proper horror in it as well it's got proper horror in it i mean when the thing comes out of the dirt that's pretty that's pretty horrific but i loved the observations of grace after she was dead i mean like wait, the, the neighbor she doesn't laugh oh yeah <laughs> I love yeah. that. I love the fact, like you know, the ultimate has really happened to you at this point. You know, you're dead, you're done, it's over, and you're still, you're still, you know, we're still thinking about oh, how much we we were annoyed by that nosy neighbour or that old woman or whatnot. I mean, that's very human. I like that. I don't know what it says about me that that is like that is something I've noticed in my own writing. You know, like when you reflect on your stuff later. Yeah. And I do very often write characters that are just generally annoyed. Yes, like, and she is, she she is annoyed. <laughs> like, more than scared, more than upset, she's annoyed about it all. And yeah. Like, you know, she does, I mean, you know, she makes some effort to even save the neighbour that she doesn't like, but she's a ghost at that point, effectively. There's not really much she can do. 
And I love the way, like, it's effectively a kind of zombie apocalypse story, yeah? Where yes, the opening of one, I suppose. Yeah, um, it just sort of extrapolates from there. It just, you know, there's nothing she can do about her body, which is now just operating on its own, <laughs> just, you know, biting yeah. people. So, um, for anyone who might be confused, th- this particular story is about a girl that um, is a ghost and a zombie at the same time. Yeah. I mean, th- there is a kind of, I mean, like, underneath, and it's funny. It is a funny one, isn't it? it there's, oh. a, there's a real sort of, like, sardonic undertone to the whole thing. My my general sort of principle of life is, because, um, you know, people have many hardships, and the <laughs> way that I choose um, now at this age, I, I, this is... I'm starting to understand old people that, are, that just don't give a shit anymore. Um, so I just choose to find everything funny now. So if something yep. bad happens, I'm like, right, look look for the comedy because there's nothing I can do about it. So. Yeah, I, I just love the fact that, like, Grace, I mean, like I said, she tries, when she realizes kind of what's happening, she tries to save her boyfriend, but it's kind of like, ah. Oh. She has this, when she's a ghost, she has this attitude of like, oh. You know, even when it's killing, when it's effectively killing him, you know, she's kind of like, oh, oh, God, for God's sake, you know, it's like this whole day has been a nightmare, but in a nightmare in a very conventional way, you know, her feelings on the matter are really kind of like, oh, you know, I've got home and there's a leak or I've got home and things aren't going properly. I love that. I think (laughs) treating like. A, a kind of mythical supernatural apocalypse with that attitude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I um, Some of the feedback I've had from this book that's been sure. really nice for me is that um, everyone seems to have like completely different favourite stories. Oh, right. That's interesting. So with Corpsing, my first collection, um, most people liked the same two stories in that as their favorites um mm-hmm. but this one a- a- anyone who's talked to me about it has said oh I-, I really like this one or this one or whatever so um that's that's made me feel like uh maybe i've done a little bit better with this collection overall <laughs> yeah i mean what i liked about it, like, like each of the stories it's i mean obviously the, the the running theme is apocalypse but each one is a very different it's a very different sort of frame of what apocalypse means and it and they're very 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 present day i like that it's very present day eat one of the different types of apocalypse is something we all recognize either from sort of conspiracy theories that float around on the internet or like mythical conspiracy theories or religious conspiracy the- or you know or religious uh, ideas of apocalypse i like that i really like that i mean just like baking <laughs> just, that is so so funny it's just like it you know the young witch who can't be bothered yeah it just can't get it right you know doesn't really understand the consequences of not getting it right yeah yeah i <laughs> i enjoyed writing that when i was sort of like tittering away to myself as i was typing yeah. i could see why because like in it, in her own way, she's kind of blameless. It's not necessarily her fault. You've got the mom who insists that she goes along, yeah. even though she's not properly there yet. And then they don't really give her the information that she needs properly, do they? To be fair. Yeah, exactly. You know? I, I, think, um, I think that there were some themes I might have been working with in each uh-huh. of those stories that I didn't realise like i was actually working with until yeah. way later when people like like yourself like talking to me about them because <laughs> that one i think that that's that's just a whole generation gap kind of story with like yeah. lost information and priorities and things mm. yeah absolutely and i i loved that and i you, what i like is it would have been so easy to make her the, the like the sister who makes it go all wrong it would be so easy to make her just hateful you know, to make mm-hmm. her just like the, the the villain of the piece, or the the uh, the vessel for or, you know all of the blame and the wrongness, and the story doesn't really do that. You know, mm-hmm. he is to blame, but not really, not really. It's kind of the parents' fault, isn't it? And that's that's very interesting. Or like when you're talking about sort of generational or intergenerational horror, because you've got mm-hmm. several layers going on in this. Even though it's a very funny, oddly light story. 
there's several layers of generational kind of neglect going on here. Yeah, it's um, I think anyone that has siblings as well <laughs> has probably at some point, if especially if you're the older sibling, yeah. there will come a point where you wanted to just go off with your own friends. Yep. And you were forced <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to bring a younger sibling with you that didn't even really want to be there. Exactly right. Exactly. It's it's that weird thing that happens to parents, isn't it? When they have children, where they some switch goes in their mind and they forget what it's like to be a child. They forget yeah. completely. And suddenly they don't understand. They don't understand the world of children. They don't understand what's going on. And they try to force their own template of what it means onto all of their children, regardless of age or circumstance, you know? And it's, yeah. I mean, in this instance, obviously, the uh, the ramifications of that are fairly profound. Yeah. And it's, um, it's like, it's well, it's well meaning, I think, from parents most of the time. Like, they just, they just want everyone to get along nicely. And, um, but um, yes, people are, you know, people are different from each other especially as they get older so it's, um... that's it that's it i mean i and it's interesting i just like the fact that it starts so small it starts you know it is it is it is kind of like if you didn't know any better you'd think it was like domestic teenage witches who don't really have any power at all not any real power they're just mm -hmm. sort of playing at occultism you know yeah. uh, but obviously that's not the case and what they're doing actually despite like the teenage trapping that they have is yeah. really profound <laughs> i uh, i really um ap apocalyptic fiction is like right up there for me in my yeah. in my favorite horror subgenres and i also really like witches mm -hmm. um and demons and stuff and it's yeah. the kind of stuff that i can't seem to like I know there are books out there, but like scary adult witch horror is surprisingly hard to find. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a hard one to write, isn't it? I imagine it's a it's a genre that isn't hasn't had. You know how like you know when The Walking Dead came out, suddenly everything was zombie apocalypse fiction. It was mm -hmm. everywhere to the point where it burnt out, and then you got Twilight kind of informing a load of vampire romance and whatnot. The yeah. witches haven't really had that for a long time. There hasn't been that thing that's sparked off that 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 huge efflorescence of wit or occult fiction. Yeah, I I find it that we're we're lacking in witches and werewolves. Yes. Yeah. There's and it's way more of everything else. <laughs> yeah, werewolves are very difficult. I find they're very difficult to make credible. You know? Yeah. I think I think that the issue with werewolf stories, um, in my opinion, is that because the sort of uh, metaphor behind werewolves is like <laughs> duality, and yeah. um, you know maybe like suppressed parts of your personality, I think it's kind of hard to write a werewolf story um, that's about something else. Maybe yeah. I think that that's what it's a kind of um, it's just such a common theme, and it's like. It's usually someone is struggling with the beast side of themselves or whatever. It's very, yeah, it's very codified, isn't it? It's very codified, and it's hard to break out of that and make it into something more resonant or more profound. I mean, there are there are rare examples. I mean, things like Ginger Snap, for example. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Because I mean, werewolves, lycanthropes in general in mythology, have always been phenomenally male. Like, yeah. Like almost down the line, they've always been a metaphor for so repressed masculinity, ultimately for sort of like you know the 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 and the appetites and the, you know the atavistic side of men, ultimately. Mm -hmm. So, to, but obvious. I mean, when you look at werewolf mythology, it obviously makes sense to make it about womanhood and to make it about the lunar cycle and the menstrual cycle, and that, that makes so much sense. <laughs> It's so funny that you should say that because I'm currently working on a real story. <laughs> oh, oh, I think I think that you might enjoy based on what you've just said. I'll have to send it. Oh, to you. okay. I yeah, need oh. some, um, I need some sensitivity readers though because oh, okay. um, there's a there's a I'm having a bit of a I can't really say anything about it apart from oh. I'm having a bit of an issue with one element of it. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm going to have to appeal to the the wider reading public to let me know if I've done an offence. <laughs> so. oh, oh, right. Okay. No, I'd love to read it. Love to. 
I've always, I mean, you know, I say werewolves are a hard sell and they kind of are for me. You know, I find that yeah. a lot of werewolf fiction and cinema is like, like you were saying, it's very down the line. It's very predictable. And th th there are very, very few examples where it sells the horror of this thing or the, or even the appeal of this thing. I mean, that, that's something we've seen with vampires a lot. Obviously they, they, after, you know, after Anne Rice and whatnot, they became very desirable entities rather than horrific entities. Um, yeah. The werewolf is a bit more difficult in that regard, uh, primarily because werewolves, t first of all, the transition tends to be involuntary. It's linked to the cycle yeah. of food or whatever, so you can't control it. And often when you become the wolf itself, you are, you are not that creature. You're sort of out of control and you're slave to your appetites and to its instincts and whatnot. Also, transformation is often painful. In, like, yeah. And astronomically like painful. And a, a lot of times people don't remember what they did when they were a wolf either. Yeah, so it's not like, it's not again, it's not like being a vampire where you are in total conscious control of what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, you're something else. It's it's an affliction, isn't it, ultimately? I mean, that's that's the other... That might be an interesting way to go, actually, for a, a werewolf story, because one of the other elements of, of, of lycanthropy is that it's a disease, right? It, it is something that's spread by bites uh, and through fluid... Uh, yeah. And it's an affliction. Yeah. Um, that's kind of interesting. I like that angle of it. Um, yeah, I've read, um, I've read a few werewolf books recently mm -hmm. that I liked. Um, Dave Jeffrey wrote a great little novella called um, Tooth and Claw. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, that that was all kinds of fun. That one, because um, it did it didn't really go in with the heavy themes at mm -hmm. all. It was like it was like a fun werewolf romp, you might call yeah. it. Um, yeah, that's that's the other way to go, right? Where it is like it's almost comic book. It's 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 about the the action and the violence and the 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 blood and the gru and whatnot. That works really well. I find yeah, dog that soldiers. <laughs> oh, yeah, honestly, best werewolf film in years, right? Yeah, that's a great the one. <laughs> best werewolf film. I mean, I can't believe they managed to make those those werewolves really frightening. Yeah, yeah. Creepy yeah. and and gangly and strange, and they move in this really strange and weird way. Uh, yeah, they yeah are loved gangly, it. Aren't they? <laughs> They're odd, aren't they? They they move in that very unnatural, almost puppet like way, which works for them. Yeah, yeah, I do. I I love. I really love finding like a great werewolf book or film. Yeah. But it's um, and I always like celebrate that because it's. I'm like, oh, good. This is. It's hard I have no, to um, Huh. It's hard to find, isn't it? That's the thing. Yeah, and with witches and stuff, I've got no um problem with like um sort of like YA witches or anything like that. Like that's all um that's like all really good if like that's what you're in the mood for. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. But yeah, I, I'm like, where are all the really nasty, um, you know, like the, like, like, where are all the baby sacrificing witches gone? Yeah. That's what I want to know. Like, <laughs> proper alt, like, like, I mean, like what the witch does, yeah, where it yeah. takes like, the Puritans' idea of what witches were, that very genuine fear they had, uh, uh, you know, which is totally misguided and myth mythological, obviously treats it as though it's real yeah i i, I really enjoyed brilliant. that film <laughs> Me too. i mean honestly the witch just blew my mind when i saw it for the first time it blew my mind i couldn't believe how good it was i just I I, that it. conceit of taking the religious fears the superstitions of of the puritan settlers and treating it with complete legitimacy complete yeah. sincerity I what love a, those stories. It's like, oh, look at this thing that everyone's afraid of. Turns out they were absolutely yeah. right. Turns out it's there. It's real. You know, the devil, yeah. witches, familiars, all of this stuff. That is utterly, utterly brilliant. I, and I love the fact that the film eschews irony. It completely eschews irony. So it's not, it's not judging these people, these characters for having these beliefs and for fearing yeah. these things. It's allowing for that, and it's exploring it as though it's real. Yeah. I, I just, I couldn't get over how clever that is. I couldn't, and it's not looking at it either with a, a postmodern eye. It's looking at it with their eyes. These things are real. There are witches, there are demons, there are curses, there's possession. 
there's there's even God who seems to be also a thing to be massively afraid of in this universe. Um, yeah. Oh, I, I I love demons and the devil. Like when when yeah. when I'm watching, especially if I'm watching a horror film, if mm-hmm. the thing that's going on turns out to be the devil, I'm always like, oh goody. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of in, yeah. I'm kind of in. I, I mean, I always like, this. and there's frames of the devil. Aren't there? there are different like types of the devil you can go for. So you can go like right down the Exorcist route, where the devil is pure elemental negativity, uh, which yeah. is kind of fun. Or you can yeah. go down the Miltonian route, where he has that element, but he's also more identifiable with humanity and human drives than God is. Uh, which I've always found very interesting. Well, if you, if you, um, oh, this, oh, this, I'm, I'm making myself sound a certain way on this podcast, but I'm, I'm doing it anyway. Have you ever read the, the Satanic Bible? Oh, um, Anton LaVey's book. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. So I found, like, so I did find a lot of it, like, you know, silly. Yeah. Um, a lot of the Hail Satans and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean that disrespectfully to, um, anyone, uh, but um, they, I did find that the sort of like satanic values were kind of like more morally aligned with, yeah. you know, people who have empathy. <laughs> than... Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? it yeah. really, I mean, when people, I mean, it's so interesting when people say satanists in modern parlance, in present day parlance, there's like so many gradations of what that means. So yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. There are some people who believe that Satan is real and that they worship him literally. But those people ironically are kind of inverse Christians. They believe in the mythology of Christianity, but they they've just gone the opposite way. But then you get like the Levian style mm-hmm. Satanists who actually don't believe it's real at all. They don't believe in it mythologically, but yeah. they believe in it symbolically and uh, morally. Which yeah. I, I find a love. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are problems with Levay and Satanism as well. But overall, it's, def- it's definitely more in keeping with what I consider to be moral and correct than... Yeah, I think things like don't hurt animals, don't hurt yeah. children, look after people. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and also, um, I mean, nurse thine desires, you know. I, I, kind of, I kind of run with that. You know, take... Take joy in things. Take pleasure in things if you want to. See beauty in the world. Don't be afraid of that. Don't fast it away. Um, yeah. At, I, at the same time, though, again, like because I'm uh, not religious, I I don't, I, and I know um, Levian Satanists don't actually believe in Satan. Um, no, but for the most part, huh? For the most part, some for of the it's, most part. it's you know yeah. it's weird. It's it's like all things. It's complicated. But for the most part, I think if you're reading Levay correctly then you don't literally believe there's like like a devil like a, a, a an actual force or, or entity called the devil it's more yeah. like a metaphor you know yeah but for me um generally speaking sort of satan or you know baphomet is um is a is a horror character and mm-hmm. it's my favorite <laughs> yes i like I, I, I you know demons and devils kind of do it for me as well i do i do like to see them turn up i mean again i mean like returning to your collection catch fire i really i oh, mean that yes <laughs> i think everyone everyone knows this, situ- this situation everyone's got this in their life somewhere where it may not necessarily be like like a sister or it can be like a friend or something mm-hmm. like that you know someone who is it's it's a relationship that's doomed isn't yeah. it it doesn't it doesn't really matter what you try or what you do and i i know that one of the things i love about this story is i know for a fact some people are going to be reading it and screaming at emily they're going to yeah. be like just just forget it she is bad news she is like she is the definition of toxic right yeah i um of all stories in the collection that's the one where the most people have like reached out to me and said mm. this is like my relationship with, with someone X, yeah yeah and it was um which i wasn't expecting you know i wasn't expecting to get any messages like that um mm-hmm. you know anything serious yeah if that makes sense but um it, it is kind of nice to know that um, for some reason, there was some sort of like feeling of kinship. Well, I think it was real. It's 
it's so it's just very well drawn you know the relationship is very well drawn because it's very 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 identifiable um it feels real it feels real and i really feel sorry i feel sorry for matt in this oh yeah because <laughs> he's trying hard i think a lot of people who read this are going to be on matt's side for the yeah. most part you know it's going to be like yeah listen listen to matt yeah he's, he's he is correct here yeah. it's already over what i love is it's over before the story starts mm -hmm. like this she is this relationship doesn't really exist in any real sense emily's trying so hard to maintain it and to hold on to it and she still feels beholden to it despite everything yeah yeah i was um sometimes when i'm writing i have so usually if i write um a story like that i when i finish it i feel a bit like emotionally drained <laughs> yeah i can see why and then that's why i like to follow up with something like dead or um just like baking yeah. i need a little bit of like levity after yes. <laughs> <bit> um... <laughs> i mean if you go to omega it might quite literally lev levity right yes yeah <laughs> um i had, but no, I had I think fun like... with uh the first emotionally one. that's it's probably for me anyway it was probably the darkest of the stories because most of them that even even the ones that have certain darkness have a certain uh, a certain wry humor about them mm -hmm. um this one doesn't as such it's it, yeah. if there is a humor it's gallows isn't it? it's the humor of like being outside the fishbowl looking in and knowing that it's really gonna get very very bad yeah, I felt I felt a bit grim to to write. I think I went off and watched something silly after it. Yeah. To just before I went to bed because I think I was afraid that I was gonna like because um well I think everyone does this if they're writing when you you try and get like as into the mind frame of the yeah. the person as possible and it's not a very nice place to go sometimes. So. No, is it? I mean, even like I mean, Emily herself is not a bad person at all. She's not a bad character, but. It, you have to get into the sister's mindset as well, don't you? And that, that is so dark. And it's knowing, recognizing this type of person. Yeah, it's, it, it's um, anxiety I inducing. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I can well imagine. I mean, like, you know, in modern parlance, triggering, you know, it's the kind of stuff that is kind of triggering and in a good way, in a, in a very good way, because it just sparks familiarity. And I think that it's this person this person who is going to usher in the apocalypse <laughs> oh this wretched person we and it's because of her wretchedness that's why it's gonna happen i just yeah love it love it <laughs> oh i'm glad so uh i'm glad i i uh yeah i had a i i had a, a great time writing that book because um uh -huh. I, I kind of like had the concept in mind and then I, I redrafted those stories a lot because I was trying to I was trying to thread little bits and pieces and clues for like the overall thing of the book, even though it's called the end, so you know it's the end. Mm -hmm. Um did you get that the um, most most people didn't catch that uh I, I can't remember any of my own characters' names now. <laughs> in Omega mm -hmm. My main character, what is her name? <laughs> I can't Grace. Omega. Grace, no. yeah, no, it's Grace. No, yeah. no, wait, Grace is in dead. Um Oh no, hang on. No, you're right, you're right. It's where are we? <laughs> Omega, here we are. Pastor Bob, of course. Maddie. 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 So a lot of people like just didn't realise that that is the same Maddie from the first story. Oh, Oh no! I, no, I no, I did, I did not click. I it, it didn't, it didn't occur to me. I didn't like. <laughs> yeah, if, I thought it depends. Like if you, um, I think someone um that reviewed it said, I think these are connected because uh -huh. I think, and um, it's just because they they read the book like all in one go in a, uh -huh. in one sitting. So like, uh, I think if you read it fast, then you might like be like, oh wait a minute, hold on, yeah. um. But yeah, I just um, I started feeling guilty about Maddie. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, oh, she's had enough already. <laughs> yeah, I mean, two stories worth. She's had she's had double the apocalypse, right? Yeah, without even realizing it. 
without realizing it. Yeah. Ouch. Ouch. But no, I love that. I've got a I've got a real soft spot for short story collections that have a like really strong theme and running elements through them. Um and that, yeah, it did it for me. I thought it was great. I read I I mean I think I read it in like two halves. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean that's the that's the other thing about the Black Shot Shadows books in general. They are so readable. Yeah, yeah. I so I love readable. those. I love them. I um I, if I want to read one of those, I try to make sure I've got enough time to like do the whole book in one because because yep. this this short and I just like to, um, I really enjoyed Rachel Knightley's um, Beyond Glass. I think hers is called, mm-hmm. um, because she had a couple of little connecting things. Yeah. Um, and I yeah I I love. I love that. I think one of the best crafted short story collections I've ever read, and it still blows my mind, is um, Kit Powers' um, A Warning About Your Future Enslavement. That's very good, isn't it, Kit? I actually read like the early drafts of that short story collection because Kit yeah. sent me like, feedback. Um, yeah, it's brilliant. It's really brilliant. It, it just, it, I, you know, oh god, it's so good. My mind was spinning about how he had like the brain power to conceive uh-huh. of it, and actually, because, um, so for people who don't know it, it's the full title is a warning about your future enslavement that you will dismiss as a collection of short stories and essays by Kit Power. Uh-huh. By Kit Power. <laughs> yeah, by Kit Power. Um, yeah and it's um it's like yeah essays and short stories by kit power that are like threaded together through um like a central narrator yes it's really interesting he's got like an uh, like a structure like a scaffold that yeah connects all of the stories together um and it's it's really it is very very clever i love i mean i love that stuff i've got a real soft spot for that when Me writers too. do that it was, it was so ominous because I, because that that the central thing going through that, I was so I was just disturbed. I was like, "What? What yeah. is it? What is yes. happening?" <laughs> um, I mean, each of those stories and essays is kind of disturbing in and of itself because it is. I mean, it's it's what the title says. It is. It is about yeah. imminent systemic collapse. That's what that, yeah. that collection is about. Which is, obvi- I mean, obviously, it's a preoccupation of of Kit's. You know, it runs through his fiction. And it oh, runs so through good. that collection in a, a beautiful way, but it is dark. I mean, th- those stories, a lot of them are really, really nasty. Yeah, he he's a, uh, oh God, he's so talented. <laughs> Kit's good. Kit's oh, very, he's so good. good. I'm very honored to be associated with him. Um, yeah. You know, me- always. But like, like yeah, I mean, it is a preoccupation for me. I, d- I do this in my you know, I've done this with everything I've ever written. You know, all of my short story collections have a similar thing going on. Um, yeah, it's it, I I like it. I enjoy it. I think it lends short story collections in particular. It lends them not just a through line but a rhythm. It gives them flavor and a, a sense of greater import than they might otherwise have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I um, yeah, that's. Yeah, I love writers who kind of like have a thing and they're really good at exploring it. Yeah. Um yeah, I I th- I I love everything that Kit's written. I oh, wrote, yeah. I I uh, recently made a video for Happy Goat Horror um mm. entitled The Best Horror Writer You've Never Heard Of. Yes. Yes. About Kit and I know people have heard of him but just like in the sort of like wider global scope. Um uh-huh. They have yeah. on this channel. They've heard yes. a lot about it on this channel. <laughs> <laughs> He's so good. For, for, since the first book I read of Kits, I've been I've been telling anyone that will listen to me <laughs> to read Kit Power. No, honestly, I mean his his work is really it can be it, like phenomenally dark. Yeah. I mean, my God, some of it is like it's it's like one read per year because you you will not come out feeling correct if you read it more than once. You know. Um, yeah. But it's it's all very good, the fiction and the non-fiction. Obviously, I mean, you know, I was I was still so honoured that he, he he gave me the the My Life in Horror series to to do. Oh, you know, you're doing such a great job with it. Oh, thank you, thank it's, you. I mean, I felt, well, it's one of those things where I felt obliged to make it as good as I possibly. Kit did such a a, a brilliant job 
with that series. Oh, he he's he's um equally talented with like non fiction as he is with fiction. He's um he's just he's just great at telling you a story, whether it's you know from real life or um yeah he's yeah, honestly yeah he is a kid's great kid kid is like the real deal the real deal uh, yeah and I I feel like excited that like. I've so so far I've just been like reading everything he puts out as he puts it out and I, yeah. I'm excited to see like I wholeheartedly believe that he's got like a long career coming mm -hmm. in publishing I think so. um I so think I'm so. yeah I'm excited to see him like actually get his break you know <laughs> I know he will I'm sure yeah. you know he will we, he's, he's sort of edging towards it there's more exposure happening now you know um yeah we, we managed to somehow bag that Hellraiser thing last year. Yeah. Uh, that was amazing. <laughs> yeah. That was just freaking amazing, that was. I don't know how that happened, but it was brilliant. <laughs> you know, one step closer to Barker. I mean, for me, that's, that's a, that is just gravy. That is the most brilliant thing. I know. He's so, that, that would be sort of like me getting to do something that's officially anything to do with Stephen King can you imagine i mean he's he's a legend isn't he? i mean like yeah this guy is synonymous with horror you could put his picture next to the definition of it in the in the in the dictionary yeah i'm, st I'm still getting my clive barker education and oh, really? um, oh. yeah he's relatively new to me and i got like so angry that i hadn't like read him before wow so, I, I kind of envy you that to be honest oh i'm having a like he's so good honestly I, I, yeah he, he's like on another level to like everyone isn't it he's like in on some other in some other universe mm -hmm. who are your sort of like do you have authors that are your like current obsessions like newer people that you found oh god yeah absolutely laura marrow stuff i mean you know when there was that like that huge explosion in in women in horror like yeah. about five years ago you had you had Priya Sharma, Georgina Bruce coming out. You had Laura Mauro. I, I read, I actually got um, all three of their, their first short story collections in like mm -hmm. one, one delivery and read them all. And I, it was the first time in years where I sat there and it was like, this is new. This yeah. is, this is, these are the kinds of stories I have never read before. Mm -hmm. in my life i had never read anything like them before and i was like this is where it's going this is where this is how things are gonna like open up in the genre this is these new concerns and these new styles of stories these new voices mm -hmm. yeah that's yeah. kind of where my interests lie at the moment yeah i um i subscribe to georgina's newsletter mm -hmm. she's hilarious <laughs> yeah she is she's yeah. very fun very profound as well like very insightful yeah i've got um i have a few obsessions at the moment so i've got like adam neville and tim <laughs> levin are like my longer running yeah. ones um where i just love everything they put out basically <laughs> at the moment and then newer i've just um well Gemma and more i'm very into at the moment and rachel harrison i've just discovered oh. um Yes. Yeah, I just just read Black Sheep by Rachel Harrison, and I've never been happier in my life. So I immediately yes. went online and added everything she's ever written to my wish list. <laughs> that is the best thing ever, isn't it? When you find a writer like that, where you're like, oh, I've got to write, I've got to get everything. Yeah, I, I may have had a little late night shop of everything Gemma or Moore has ever written <laughs> last night. <laughs> An uh, accidental. Or recently, Paula Dash. Oh my. God. God. Oh yeah, yeah. I've got. Um, is it? We are here to hurt each other. Have you read it yet? No, no. Honestly, honestly, that I read it and I was like, he, she is the most sincere heir of Barker I have ever come across. It oh, is really. It's oh. so beautiful. I, I, it knocked me on my ass. That short story collection. Oh, I'm excited. Couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't believe it. Eric LaRocca. Eric LaRocca. I, I, Eric is just carving out a space out oh, there. Did, didn't Eric just get a book deal with um, yep. Norman Reedus's um, 
Pred- oh, that's I'm so happy for him. Like uh, that's no. I mean, Eric started as well. Eric started from such humble beginnings, like a self-published book that did yeah. phenomenally well and deservedly so. I mean, it, it is, it, it's an incredible career and I, I, their work. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. Again. Yeah. I, I love- lot- Sorry, go on. There's a lot of stuff, isn't there? There's like, it's an embarrassment of riches out there. That's, that, I, I find that part of the, on a personal level, part of the problem. It's like where, there's so much I want to read. There's so much I, I know. I, I You'll never get through it all <laughs> before you die. Like that's always <laughs> that's a great anxiety of mine. Like I will never read all the books I want to read yeah. before I yeah. shuffle off the mortal coil. <laughs> You've got. I mean, like I, at the moment, I am so magpie in that regard. You know, I'm so magpie about it. I will just flip from one thing to the other, and I'll pick up all these collections and novels, and just you know. I, I, it's it's so, but isn't it a wonderful thing? Yeah, it's so cool to be in that position. Something that I've really loved seeing recently as well is um, indie, like people who started as indies, like um, Eric, um, like w- watching in real time, like their yeah. careers going off, because yeah. publishing is is really hard to get into now. Um, because you've got like your big five, as they say where you you know you typically get an agent and then an agent will sell your book to one of these publishers and that's like sort of the traditional dream for people but that yeah. is you i i've been recently getting the feeling that in order to get an agent you have to have an audience already now yeah that's definitely the case and also it's not necessarily the best way to do it anymore yeah well uh, I, I mean adam neville went indie mm-hmm. after after having representation and and publishing through um oh god i've already forgotten who published his uh, first <laughs> bunch of books now um but he he you know he was um doing really well but yeah i wa- i've watched a lot of podcasts where he's talked about his decision to like just basically do it by himself and i think it's just the the consensus for some reason in mainstream books is oh people don't like horror which is not true. <laughs> it's absurd, isn't it? I mean, it, yeah. they must be so disconnected from the market that they ought to operate in, if, if that's what they believe. Because it's yeah. huge. It's yeah. huge. I mean, it, it's so huge. It's it's almost impossible to get a bead on. There's so much stuff out there. There's so many voices erupting all over the place, and new voices at that, who are bringing their own concerns and their own new issues and subjects to it. It's It's brilliant it's just such a lovely time to be operating in and i think like yeah. you know i mean i know that as in any sort of like community of of human beings there is going to be stuff there's going to be drama there's going to be this and then there's that but i do find that i think we need to celebrate that more yeah i um something that i just really love about the the indie horror spaces is like it doesn't feel like people are in competition with each other to me no 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 we're all it's so mutually supportive. That's what's always shocked me, actually, from the very beginning when I first started getting stuff published. It's how nice and how mutually supportive everyone has been. Yeah, I just I feel yeah. like there's just room for all of us. Yeah. Like, there doesn't have to be Not. a limit on the number of you know great indie authors there are selling books oh. and... People who love to read will buy more than one book. Absolutely. (laughs) And we are all unique voices. You know, every single one of us, no matter what similarities we might have, we are all exploring and expressing our own things in our own unique ways. So, you know, there's space for every voice out there. It is not a competition. And if you, I think treating it as a competition would probably be the worst. I think it would, it would, it would, it would eat your mind, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think the the only time where anything is officially a competition is if you're looking at awards. Yeah, but, yeah. but you know that's that's friendly though, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I found that like a lot of a lot. Of, I mean, you know, it's um, it must be lovely to have them, but at the same time, it's not. It's really not that big a deal, is it? No, I um I have been excited though because the end is in has made the final ballot for the Imagine Awards. Yeah, that's brilliant. I was very surprised to open that email um, 
delighted because I've never had anything nominated for anything before. So, um, you know, I I don't think I care if I actually win. I'm just thrilled no. that, um, <laughs> that it was put That's... in front of people that liked it. So. Well, that is superb. Congratulations. That oh, is absolutely you. superb. And I know I loved reading it. I really did. It was so much fun. And like I oh, said, I kind of read it in two halves, you know, and I imagine if I if I wasn't if I'd had like a couple of days off, it would have probably been in one. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I really appreciate that, George. Thank you. I um, oh, it's a pleasure. It's um, I think I've done I've done better so far with the end than I did with my first collection. I spent a lot more time on it. And um, yeah. um, I, and also I kind of like, you know, I know to try and market my own book this time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <just> probably <laughs> helps. I, I'm terrible at that. That is, it's, I am so bad at that. It's unbelievable. It's the worst. <laughs> it, it is, isn't it? Because you always feel like you, you almost feel like you're being a bit hucksterish, don't you? You know, like you. And it's not the case. It's just something you've got to do, isn't it? It's just, it's just part of the whole thing. But I just, I find it difficult. I find it hard with my own stuff. Yeah, I, I've got no problem saying to people, hey, listen, guys, I just read <laughs> this uh, this great book by Gemma and Moore, and you should all, all right. everyone, drop what you're doing and go read this Gemma and Moore book. And then when I've got something out, I'm like, um, please, if everyone doesn't mind, if you, yes. want, you haven't got to buy it, if you could just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm exactly the same i'm exactly the same <laughs> so, sorry for spamming sorry for spamming yeah yeah i know i know the feeling you you, you don't want to feel like you're being egregious do you like you know you, you're kind of muscling it or stepping on anyone's toes or anything it's um, i i always feel like odd, i'm spamming it? people if i'm trying to just promote my own stuff so i yeah. do it sparingly but then if I see other authors promoting this stuff, it doesn't bother me at all. So I don't, I, I, I never, I never. It's like share that. immediately, yeah. you know, there, yeah, let's get that stuff out there. Share, share, share. You know? And in fact, even better, if it's an author that I've like been waiting for their next book to come out. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh good. There it is. There it is. Yeah. It's out now. I can go get it. <laughs> oh brilliant well kaylee thank you so so much for coming on and guys uh the end by kaylee dobbs it's available over at uh, black shuck books at the moment um it's it's really good fun it's oh really, thank you really george <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure my pleasure so, is there anything else that you'd like to pimp up before we go oh um uh, well, this isn't my own, but Rachel Harrison's Black Sheep is really good, and also Tim Tim Levin's Among the Living. <laughs> Still hopping on about those. <laughs> oh, brilliant! I mean, that's that's so nice. I will actually put links below um, to both of them, and and also to where you can buy uh, the end as well. Uh, as for myself, guys, it's the same as usual. You can find me knocking about here on Exaggerated Elegy or on Our Lives in Horror, depending on where you're listening to this um there's loads of stuff on the exaggerated elegy channel at the moment we are ki uh, we've just returned my my usual podcasting group we've just returned to doing hannibal digested where we look at um <laughs> like each episode of the hannibal series brian fuller's hannibal one by one uh because it is the best tv show ever made and you know we'll brook no argument <laughs> <laughs> I, w I wasn't gonna <laughs> <laughs> well how could you you know um uh, as for my published work if you go over to strangeplaygrounds.com or if you go to amazon and type in george daniel lee you'll find links to all of my short story collections and all the anthologies and collections and things that have been published in uh we mentioned it during the course of this podcast but if you go over to arrow films and look up the quartet of torment the new uh, uhd or blu-ray set for hellraiser uh the aforementioned kit power and myself are on the hellbound disc we're on featurette hell is what they wanted and it's an hour and 40 minute chat that kit and i had live uh about hellraiser and clive barker and all related stuff and we're we're, we're dead proud of it you know we're really <laughs> really 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 proud of it it came out brilliantly well so we go and check that out if you would oh uh, well Kaylee, thank you once again it's been a pleasure thank you for having me <laughs> not not problem anytime anytime until next time guys bye bye, bye.
Come on. 